So um, I, I'm, I'm very excited, by the way. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to be talking about uh, Pirkei Avot, obviously from the Mishnah. And uh, we usually talk about Torah and Tanakh, but uh, there's something in Pirkei Avot I've been looking at for many years, and uh, I think it bears the same kind of close attention and intertextual techniques that, uh, that I've learned about in Aleph Beta. And so that's my presentation today. I have a lot to cover, so I'm going to go fast, skip a few things, um, and see if I can get it all done today. So, of course, I'm talking about um, Im Ein Anili Mili, uh, which is attributed to uh, Hillel. And um, I, I've heard this all my life, and I'm, I'm showing it here with what I consider to be the, um, the usual translation. And uh, what I'm going to do today is um, basically retrace my own personal journey with this, uh, which um, started in 2011 when I heard uh, Rabbi Mark Gelman give a series of sermons about this. And um, my conclusions are totally different from his. But what I owe to him is the suggestion that it might mean something very different from what we usually think it means. So, you know, sometimes we're, we're my little illustration there, uh, sometimes we're imprisoned by a common understanding that uh, we've grown up with and has been in our heads forever. And uh, Rabbi Gelman opened the door to that cage for me. And this is a story of uh, w where I ended up and how I got there. Um, inspired by him in 2011, I got to a certain point, And then I chanced upon something in the Zohar in 2016, which had a, some impact. And then as I was preparing for this um, in late 2017, I had a big aha moment. And that's my quote unquote final answer. So before I start, I, I want to point out that uh, this is a unique text in Pirkei Avot. And it's unique in ways that I think make it stand out in basically uh, all of our literature. But Certainly, I, I, I look through everything in Pirkei Avot, and I think you have three main things there. You have straight advice, do this or don't do that. You have observations of life. You know, there are three kinds of people, this, that, and, and so on, which usually imply some kind of advice. And, and there are some questions, but they are the type of rhetorical question which is asked and then immediately answered. You know, well, why do we say this? Because here it's written that that and, and so on. So we have some questions, but they're, they're immediately answered. Here we have three questions that are simply standing there as questions. They are not answered. And furthermore, they're asked in the first person. We, we, we just don't see that every day. And, and it's very powerful because if you then read that, the first person becomes you, and that really evokes identification and a sense of participation. It's like compels you to try to answer these questions because the subject is you. Now, we usually think of them as rhetorical questions, and the whole thing about rhetorical questions is you have to infer what's being said. So I think number three, if not now, when, is pretty clear. But uh, I'm going to suggest that uh, one and two, not so much. And uh, for the sake of time, and, and I think it's really the key, I'm going to be focusing mainly on number one. So let me start by quickly reviewing the common understanding. 
Um, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? There's this obvious answer, no one will. So the implied statement you have to infer is if, if I'm not for myself, no one will be for me. And it's usually understood as I should love and respect myself. And, and then and only then other people will love and respect me. I think that's a, a reasonable statement, at least of what I've always understood from this. And then the, the second one, uh, again, the common translation, uh, but if I am for myself only, what am I? Uh, obvious answer being a, a despicable person. And, uh, you know, so the, the message being I should love others as well as myself. So there we have it. I should love myself because if I don't, no one will love and respect me, but not exclusively, okay? And it sounds very wise and very true and, you know, everybody's happy. Uh, but I want to challenge it. And my challenge is not based on the truth value of that idea that's being expressed in that common understanding. It, it may indeed be a very true and wise thing to say, but my challenge is based on what is the Hebrew actually saying and how good is that translation of what's there in the text. So that requires some close looking. I think that um, right off the bat, we can see some problems with the translation. Um, and I've, I've highlighted uh, parallels in English, which create a certain sense of what this means. The if in, uh, in question one and question two, and the for myself in question one and question two, which in Hebrew are not parallel at all. The if is... What's translated as if is im, which means if, and chesha, which means something much closer to when. And uh, what's translated as for myself in the first case is li, in the second case is la'atzmi, qu quite really different words. And then we have in, this, in the uh, usual translation of number two, the word only in English but there's no word only on the Hebrew side. So that's kind of inferred in the, what I call the usual understanding. It's not an unreasonable inference, but it's not there in the text at all. Now, <clears throat> all right, that's basically what I was explaining. Beyond all that, uh, there really is a cornerstone of my challenge and that is in the meaning of this word, li. Because if we're not understanding that word correctly, then that whole usual translation has really much more serious and fundamental problems. So uh, this is my cornerstone uh, of my idea here. And um, so what, what does li mean? Okay, well, let's talk about le. Um, I, I, the, the definition of le is, is quite long. Uh, I'm going to simplify it and say that uh, it's very similar to the English words two or four sometimes, but it's, if it's four, it's in the possessive sense, like this buds for you. Or it's indicating the recipient of an action with an action verb. It's what we call in English the uh, indirect object. And um, as I'll explain, you know, in the English word for has another meaning, which is like pro, in favor of. Um, I'm going to argue that even if you read the long definition of le exhaustively, uh, you're not going to find the idea of that other me English meaning of for, the idea of in favor of. I also want to point out that, that Li, the, the simple meaning is to me, not to myself. It's not reflexive. La'at's me is reflexive. Li is not. Now, there are 629 
uses of Li in Tanakh. Uh, I didn't read them all, but I read many of them. So I'm going to comment further on how Li is used. First of all, it's rarely used without a verb. In, in Hillel statements, there, there is no verb, but it's rarely used without a verb. You know, without a verb, usually it's the implied to be. But Li is, is rarely used without a verb. Give me, tell me, do for me. And even uh, with the verb to be, where it means is to me or basically mine, um, the Hayu Li, Halavi'im, uh, and the Levites are mine uh, from Numbers. Now, used without a verb, these are five examples that I found. It, it means is mine or I have. I mean, I, you could talk about these examples for a long time. I, I really for some reason, I just love each one of these examples. But uh, Tsar Li Ma'od, uh, Sha'ul is the speaker. You know, I am greatly troubled. I, I, I just love the way that's structured with the Li in the middle so that the Ma'od sort of modifies both Tsar and Li. But, y y you, you know, trouble to me much, implying to be... And, you know, I am greatly troubled, or, you know, oy veesmir, you might say. Um, um, and from Job, I, I really love this one, too, gamli lavav. Um, I also have a heart. It, you know, in conversational Hebrew, we hear yeshli to mean pretty much I have, there is to me. But here, the gam is, is, is like replacing the, the yesh. It just seems very poetic to me, okay? In Exodus, God says, Ki uh, li kol ha'aretz, for all the earth is mine. Um, and then we have these two beautiful examples from Shir HaShirim. I didn't put the exact references here, but I'm sure you're familiar with these. Dodi li vahani lo, my beloved is mine and I am his, or ani dodi vidodi li, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. The, these two beautiful poetic sentences saying essentially the same thing in slightly different order. What I'm getting at is that to translate li as for myself, meaning in favor of myself, implying all those pop psychology, self-esteem, all that stuff, it really seems like a stretch. And I'm arguing that the plain meaning of Ani Li is I am mine, and the plain meaning of Mi Li is who is mine. So I'm proposing that the translation of Imain Ani Li is... <coughs> If I'm not mine, who is mine? I'm sorry, can I just interrupt for one second there, Steve? Sure. Where are you getting, how, I understand the, the issues and how this is kind of unique in terms of Lee, but where's the jump? How are you getting to in, in on me, Lee, to me, mine specifically? Where did, is there, how, is there, did I miss something in how you're getting to translating Lee as, as in, I guess Lee is possessive, right, in terms of mine, right? Because I could say like Yeshli. Are you saying it in terms of like that? Like Yeshli, when he would say so, so, this is mine? Well, when we see Lee without a verb, I mean, Dodi Lee. I see. My so beloved is mine. Is, an is mine. So when it, it doesn't have a verb, you're saying it just means mine. That's mine or I, I have, mean. but I think, I think anili means I am mine. So if I, I, you mean anili it means it's if I am not mine. Right. Im, so I am not im mine. Ain, if not, anili. Interesting. So if I am not mine, no, there's almost as if I am giving ownership of myself to someone else, you mean anili, or I'm allowing myself to become, to become dominated by someone else. 
Well, I'm going to explore that, but okay. I think it's I think it's a bit mysterious what the heck it means. I think Ani Li is a strange phrase. I doubt that we're going to see that anywhere else. And I think even Mi Li is kind of a strange phrase. But I'm going to to propose an expansion of that meaning. I mean, that's that's sort of, um, my starting point is what I would call a very literal translation. If I am not mine, who is mine? And then so that's if I can't be mine, then who else will be mine? Would you see it like that? I, I, I'm going to get there. So you're anticipating okay. me a little bit. So, okay. Steve, can, can can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, just I'm just curious. Is it fair to um, use Tanakh uh, Tanakh Hebrew as the your data to try to infer what um, someone writing in uh, I guess it's sort of pre Mishnaic Hebrew is is uh, writing? Like maybe by that point, Lee's you know the the, the it, it the meaning had changed some en enough to to make that uh, somewhat problematic. Well, that, that's a that's David, right? I mean, that's Ezra. That was Ezra. Yeah. Oh, Ezra. Okay. Um, well, I, it, that's a valid question. Um, I mean, I don't know one, enough one way or another. I'm just asking. I, 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 I don't know either, really. I know that this is early Mishnah, and and I and and I'm told that by that time the spoken language was Aramaic and. Hebrew was uh, Lashon HaKodesh. And so that suggests to me that maybe it hadn't changed that much. Right. But, I, you know, it's possible. But I think what's gonna, what I'm going to try to do here is make such a strong case for this that it will have some persuasive value. Cool. So uh, let's start with this, who is mine? You know, we, we use that word my about people in the same way that we use it about things. But it is possible that Hillel is encouraging us to examine that. It, it really all depends on the significance of that introductory clause, if I am not mine. And we think it's cautionary, but maybe it's explanatory. Let me explain further what I mean by that. It's like two diverging paths of interpretation that are going to take us to two different places. So what do I mean? Cautionary, if you, it's, a, it's a negative if, if I am not mine. So here's a negative if. If you don't eat your spinach, will you be strong? Okay? And Here's the explanatory side. If I don't drink at all, can I have a mimosa at brunch? You, you see what I mean? It, it, the cautionary says the thing that is not, the hypothetical negative, is something that should be. But the explanatory side simply says the hypothetical negative is the way it is, and then there's something that follows from the way it is. So, you know, traditionally, if I'm not mine, who is mine? You know, if it's cautionary, it says, well, I should be mine so that others will be mine. But it could be saying, since even I am not mine, no one else is mine either. Uh, so, In other words... Yeah, in other words, maybe the if statement is is a truth. I'm not mine because I belong to God and I'm part of the community. So it's it's then sort of if even I am not mine, how can I think that some other person is mine? <laughs> <laughs> if ain anili mili. So it's still a rhetorical question. The answer is still nobody. But the meaning and purpose is very different. Basically, the, the meaning and purpose here becomes a caution, a different kind of caution. Don't confuse possession and love. And 
You know, I think that's a very relevant caution because we, we, we people do that all the time. And, you know, maybe possession is where everything goes wrong, you know, because mine means not yours, which means conflict, which means war, which means hell on earth. So, no, I think there's a lot of value in looking at it this other way. Uh, let me put it another way, something I just discovered in uh, Rabbi um, Shai Held's new book, The Heart of Torah, which uh, we've quoted in some of our discussions and uh, re really is a beautiful book. Um, he talks about the Pharaoh Moses dynamic as one of uh, gratitude versus ingratitude, and Pharaoh as an exemplar of ingratitude. So the, the, this argument would say that that statement, Ani Li, reflects ingratitude, our inability or unwillingness to acknowledge our dependence on or our indebtedness to anything beyond ourselves. So um, it, Rabbi Held quotes this passage from Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is commenting on Pharaoh, and he imagines Pharaoh insolently saying, Yeor uh, li va'ani aseti, the Nile is mine, I made it. <laughs> and then there's a midrash, which he quotes, that uh, suggests that Pharaoh is actually saying, you know, I created myself. And, you know, it, so I'm, I'm saying just take that one step farther. Anidli of ani aseti. I am mine, I created myself. An extreme of, of arrogance, an extreme of ingratitude. So, now, just quickly, I don't want to spend too much time on number two, uh, but, um, uh, you know, Hashem means when, and La'atzmi is reflexive. I think that uh, a better translation of number two is, and when I am alone, what am I? And, you know, I think that... Um, it's, it's a lot like no man is an island. It, it, it reminds me a lot of what Hillel says just a, a few verses later. Don't separate yourself from the community. So here's, this is what I, basically what I got to in 2011. It was a, I thought it was a significant milestone, and it really helped me see this in a very different way. You know, you don't own yourself, you don't own anyone else, you belong to God, everyone else belongs to God, and so that's what we have in common that makes us a community, and it's really meaningless to try to isolate yourself from the community. And, and I think that is, um, you know, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> Uh, and I think it's a lot more true to the Hebrew if we look at the Hebrew without a head full of what we've heard all our lives. Um, so wait, wait, wait. Um, Can I just say, Steve, so you, you sure. want to propose that maybe the most famous uh, influential statement made by any rabbi in world history that we've all been interpreting it wrong. Is that basically what you're suggesting? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You understand me perfectly. <laughs> Um, can I can I just help on the the mealy part? Yeah. So if you, is, you're proposing that it's, um, let me see if I get this right. I may not need mealy mealy. Uh, <laughs> it's hard for me to. I'm so caught in the usual way of, of understanding it that, that I don't know if I get it. Um, the mealy is so if if uh, if I'm not mine, you're saying. So if it's not the case that I own myself, right. how could I own others? Is Precisely. What you're saying, right. Okay. And but it can it, does that fit into mealy? How could I own others? Um, well, I, I think mealy I is I, a very puzzling phrase. Yeah. And I, I will have more to say about this. I see. Um, 
And then the second half you're saying so me, is... Mealy would, would be who else could possibly be mine. That's exactly. Right, right, that's right. what I'm saying here. Who else could possibly be mine? The question then is, what how does Ukshani Atmi fit in, though, as a natural pair with that? Well, and if... It, 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 that's saying... Um, you know, what, I think la'atzmi is reflexive, and it means to myself, which is pretty much alone. So I'm saying, and when I'm alone, what am I? Uh, and I think that if I'm, you know, if I'm right. not mine, and, so like and no one else is and mine and either, I belong. The idea is that I, so so the, the, when you put the two statements together, it feels to me like they say, if uh, that can't lost him. can't own anyone that would be statement number one right and statement number two would be but i can't but i must be connected to others i can't right. own others but i must be connected to them because we all have the same owner so what i, thing I, 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 would say, I am have connected. The same what <laughs> sorry steve because we all have the same what the same owner, owner? Yeah. okay yeah, I, I'm I, I'm uh, reminded of um, the verse in Vayikra where it says where God says Kili Vene Israel Avadim Avadayim. In other words, these are again Lee. He's saying the, you can't be slaves because they're because you can't have a slave. It's a section talking about slavery and talking about the Yovel. And he says the reason you can't is because I'm the, because they're my slaves. So Ena Lee Lee me Lee is if I, if I, I'm, I'm a slave to God. I can't be having anyone else as a slave. That's that's the message of that of that of, uh, that pasuk in in, uh, in Vayikra Cafe. Yeah, pretty much. That's that's sort of this point in the journey. Okay, um, but wait, there's more. <laughs> okay, that was the 2011 conclusion. Now, I stumbled across. So I, I am not a big um, Zohar Kabbalah guy not because I don't like the esoteric perspective. I'm a true child of the 60s, and I love the esoteric perspective. It's just that, personally, I prefer getting those kinds of meanings out of the mainstream stuff. And I think the Zohar is so far out that it's sort of something that's easy to get lost in it. But I'm not putting it down. I'm just talking about my personal taste. But once in a while, I pick it up and look at it. And in, in 2016, I just happened to stumble across this passage quite early in the Zohar, which says, I mean, to my, imagine my amazement, <laughs> it said that me and Ma are not questions. They're, they're not who and what that me and Ma are names of God. Now, um, Zohar explains this in its own unique way, and I, I won't try to explain it. It's not my main idea here, but may, maybe you can sort of see the idea that these questions, if directed towards the ultimate, if directed toward existence, sort of like turn into the answer. You know, I, I don't know how to explain it, but this is what's proposed. And, and I don't know if Hillel was into this sort of thing. I'll say a little more about that. But since these three questions have me and Ma in them, it did sort of shine a new light on what they might mean. You know, here, here's the, uh, the Zohar one uh, translation of it. And uh, it, it goes on and on. This is just part of it. And uh, this is an old translation by a guy named Norho de Manhar, uh, Norno de Hu. I, I won't go into it. Uh, these slides will be posted. Um, and it, it, Safaria confirms it. Uh, this, is, this is where you can find it uh, in Safaria, uh, Zohar. And it's definitely there. But... You know, if you take me and Ma to being God, okay, if it, if I am not mine, God is mine. And when I'm alone, 
I am God. I mean, putting it very crudely. Or um, to put it a little bit more uh, poetically in English, if I let go of the consciousness of me and mine, I can experience my real divine identity. And when I'm alone, the divine is present in me. Now, this is definitely a kind of a, a Kabbalistic perspective on life. It fits with a lot of other wisdom traditions as well. Um, I thought it was interesting to imagine Hillel with an esoteric perspective. But uh, we know that Hillel could not have read the Zohar. Uh, it, but even by any stretch, it didn't exist at that time. Um, and my very good friend, Rabbi Dr. Gil Nativ, said to me, the idea that me and Ma are names of God would make no sense to Hillel. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if he's correct, but you know, that's very possible. Um, but this definitely opened a door for me into something that I finally came up with, like, um, you know, I think a much better and more plausible way of looking at this. So now we're talking about um, uh, late 2017 when I was reconsidering all this and uh, preparing this presentation. And I'm happy to say this is moving along nicely time-wise. So uh, I think I, I'm going to have to dig time to dig into this in a little more detail than I thought I would have, and I, that's kind of cool. So, <clears throat> my aha was, well, maybe it's not a rhetorical question. Maybe it's a riddle. So what are the characteristics of a riddle? Uh, I think there are three. Uh, the first one is alliteration and wordplay. Um, the second one is it's a question, but it comes across as a puzzle. It's more than just a question. And the third characteristic is that there is a clever answer that not only solves the puzzle, but explains the real meaning behind that puzzling question. Okay, so let's take those three and see if they apply to Imain Anili Mili. Okay, alliteration and wordplay. Boy, I think we sure have that. It's, it's only six words. Five of them are only one syllable. The last four of the six words rhyme. Ani, li, mi, li. It's very rhythmic. Emain, ani, li, mi, li. And um, have you noticed that ain and ani are anagrams of each other? You just flip the last two letters. So I think on... Um, you know, the criteria of alliteration and wordplay, that's a check mark. I mean, you know, imain anili mili, what's black and white and red all over? It's got that riddle uh, wordplay to it. Okay, now, does it come across as a puzzle? This goes back to some of the questions you, are, you were asking earlier. You know, what, what, what does Ani Lee mean? I mean, <laughs> who, whoever talks like that, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I never really thought about it. Am I mine? Am I not mine? What does that mean? You know, it, it's kind of strange. And me, Lee, it probably makes a little more sense. But still, I'm going to bet that we don't see that phrase many other times in, in all of the uh, history of our literature. So I think there is a feeling of a puzzle here. It is not, you know, a rhetorical question should be obvious. And what I'm suggesting is that this is not obvious. Can I jump in? I'm, I'm wondering, Steve, if this is where you're going. 
sorry, but I can't resist, <laughs> that, that, the, that the two possible explanations which you suggested as to whether it's explanatory or whether it's, um, I forget what you called the other one. Cautionary. Cautionary, that maybe they're both true and that's the nature of the riddle. In other, uh, words, do you, in other words, like if you think about those two, they're actually at odds with each other, right? Because if it's, or I'm, I'm not sure if it's cautionary or explanatory that's at odds with each other, but to put it this way, the second way you read it was um, that, that uh, I can't own anything, right? Is, is one thing that it might mean, which is that- Can't own any can't person. Own my, if I can't even own myself, then I can't own another. But right. the other possibility might be almost exactly the opposite, which is if I won't assert ownership over myself, how could I, or if I won't assert possession over my own self, how could I possibly possess another? And maybe those two, maybe it's not one or the other, but somehow both. And the question might ride on both and exactly what do we mean by possession. In other words, I could have sort of two definitions of possession. And the first way of thinking of it, possession is sort of more material. And, and if you own something, they're, they're yours to do what you want with. And in that sense, I can't own anybody. If I can't even own myself, who could I possibly own? Then the other is if I won't take possession, even of myself, who can I possibly take possession of? I mean, there's another sense of take possession, which is if I, if something won't be dear enough, if, if my sense of self won't be dear enough for me to at least claim it, I don't know. Um, then so, how could I claim someone else's mind? But uh, I don't know. Maybe there's, uh, maybe there, uh, there is a sense in which they're both true is just what I'm wondering. And if that's the case, that might make a wonderful riddle. That's right. I was going. Right. Um, so I hear you, and I have gone down that road, uh, and I think it, th that is also a promising road, but it's not the road I'm going down here. Okay. Uh, I will say that uh, the way I went down that road is to say, you know, like there's this English phrase, self-possessed, yep. which basically mm -hmm. means in control of yourself. Right. And I think that's where you can get a sense that they're both true and really not that different. Although it's still a little bit problematic when we talk what about... What does it mean to possess someone else? In that yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I hear you, and I think it's interesting. Uh, in the original paper I wrote, I go down that road a little bit. But in this presentation, I'm going down a different road. Okay. So now where am I going? Uh, so I also want to point out that maybe it's not just one puzzle, it's two puzzles. Because if we're talking about possession of a person, there are two sides of it. Um, who is the owner and who is owned? So when I say I am mine, that covers both sides of it. I'm the owner and I'm the owned. But if I say I am not mine, that actually raises two questions. Me, Lee, who is mine, which is the question that's explicitly asked, and whose am I? It's not explicitly asked, but it certainly does come out of im ein anili, whose am I? Um, so a perfect solution to the riddle would include both of those questions. So is there a solution that makes sense of it all? Can I ask one thing, Steve? Yes. Just um, the, the puzzles pieces are all on the first part of the sort of on the ratio. Yeah. Um, I've always thought the part that doesn't fit as well is this, is the Seifa, is the Vim Nom Right. Yeah, and I'm wondering and about that too. Does it, is that part of the puzzle somehow? And I wonder, like, I could sort of see it in the traditional interpretation uh, you're sort of getting clarity on, you know, why we do what we do, you know, mission. And then, uh, and by the way, let's get going or something like that, you know? Um, and then, and then I'm sort of, 
uh, I haven't thought about it much, but how it relates to how, you know, your interpretation of how we should think about the first, the, the, the ratio of, 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 um, right. So my, my very last slides, if we have time with them are on in a Nachshav, a Matai and somewhat about how they relate. But, okay. but as I said, I'm, really focusing primarily on Imain on Ili Mili, which I think is fair because that is sort of the gauntlet that's laid down. And, okay. and I think if we can get that right. It's, we're, we're more likely to get the other ones right. And I, and I would acknowledge that I'm not fully covering the other ones. Okay, fair enough. <clears throat> so is there a solution to this riddle? So earlier I gave you two examples from Shir Hashirim. Dodi li va'anilo and anila dodi v'dodi li. And uh, yeah, from Shir Hashirim. And Hillel may not have known the Zohar, but he definitely knew Shir Hashirim. And I wonder if his use of the word li without a verb could be an allusion to Shir Hashirim. And could the answer to the riddle be in Shir Hashirim? So, here's my reasoning. <laughs> At the very least, you'll get a kick out of it. <laughs> so, Ani the Dodi Vidodi Li. It doesn't say Ani Li Vidodi Li. Why not? Because Im Ani le Dodi. Ain ani li. Okay. Simple logic. So Hillel took the last part of that, ain ani li, put it at the beginning, turned it into a question, and he got a riddle. Im ain ani li, me li. And if you take the other one, Dodi li va anilo. I mean, that's the answer. Imain anili mili, dodi li va anilo. And that completes the answer. You know, tells who is mine, the beloved is mine, and whose am I? I am the beloved's, I am his. And uh, hold on one second. I am. I think I'm lost. I, um, slow down. Can we just do that again in slow motion? Sure. <laughs> so what I'm suggesting, I'll go back a slide, is that this riddle is an allusion to Shir Hashirim. Got it. Specifically, these two beautiful poetic statements in Shir Hashirim, which I would argue, if we're going to understand Shir Hashirim as a as a poem that, in addition to being about erotic love, is a poem about the relationship between uh, human beings and God. Then these these two statements, Ani le Dodi va Dodi Li, and um, Dodi Li va Ani Lo, which, by the way, Rabbi Foreman, those two statements, they don't occur next to each other, but they're a perfect example of the uh, rhetorical device called chiasmus, which is kind of the simple version of the chiasms that uh, have become so important to you in your work, because they simply cross each other. Ani le dodi va dodi li, dodi li va ani lo. It's a cross, and chiasm comes from chi, which is a cross. So, um, but they go together, they, they, they complement each other, they both say the same thing. So, uh, again, the reasoning is, Shir, I'm trying to work backwards from Shir HaShirim to the, to the riddle. I'm suggesting the train of thought that could have been in Hillel's mind. So it says, Ani le dodi vidodi li. And I'm saying, it doesn't say, Ani li vidodi li. Because, now I'm speaking Hebrew, Im ani ladodi, if I am my beloved, then ain ani li. Because I can't, okay? So now I got ain ani li. 
I put that first, I make it into a question with if. I see. So you may not nearly, nearly, the answer is anila da di Well, the answer, the answer is the other one. The answer is no The answer is no dili, va anilo. It could be it could be either, but I'm I'm arguing it this way. Your riddle translates then to let me riddle you this. If I am not to me, to who am I? Yeah, something like that? Right. And then the answer becomes, well, you belong to God. Dodili. And God is the one who is to you, if anyone is to you. Right. Vanilo. And and how do you get to the assumption that there can be no joint ownership? <laughs> well, you'll have to just bear with me on that. <laughs> I, I see that can be questioned, but uh, I think it's reasonable to make the assertion. And then, so then just, I'm also pointing out the word play anilo, which means I am his, but it suggests lo, which is no which could also be where the idea of ain, ani, you know, there's a negative with I. I, I, I just think, think fit is so perfect that it's not a coincidence. That's, that's what I'm proposing. I, I, thought of, when I thought of this kind of concept before. I think a, a, a kind of a parallel can be thought of like in chemistry, where if you have inert elements, then they can't form bonds with any other elements other than themselves. Uh, so, you know, helium can't form a bond with anything else, but if it's missing something, so, you know, you have both sides can connect. So you can have an ili, di, 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 li, but it can't be any li, because if it's any li, you're an inert element who can't form any breathe, any connection with any other, uh, with any, any other side. So it has to be both. And as it does have to be an ili, di, 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 li, it has to be mutual for it to work. I, I, would, agree. I would agree with that. Yes, Rabbi Foreman? No, so I'm just saying, picking up on David's point, it would seem that a prerequisite, from, if you take David's idea, a prerequisite for me being to my beloved is that I'm not exclusively to me. So then, the, but isn't the, would the language in Ainali be a little strange then, right? Because it's really, the predicate is, I can't be just for myself. Maybe that's Ukshani la Atmi Ma'ani. I don't know, but it, the Imei Nani really sounds more like, uh, well, if that's the way it is, then who will be for me? When really it's, I can't just be for me because then I, I want to have the ability to connect to somebody else. I'm just saying the Imei Nani Li seems a little funny. Okay, let, let me continue because I'm going to, address that to some extent, and then we can come back to that thought. So, um, Steve, here's can I just throw something your way? Sure. Um, when you're speaking about the low, low, and specifically in this kind of context, um, I was looking for, I can't, I can't find which one of the Psalms it is, but uh, in Hebrew, it's Mizmor Le Toda. It's a song of thanks. And one of the lines there is, uh, okay. It means know that God is the one who has made us. And then there's, it says, We are his, uh, his people and his uh, sheep that he shepherds. Now the word low there has what you, it's called the Korean Kativ. It's read one way and written one way. And it's, it's both the no and the to him. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that the convergence there of the idea of a, a verse they're talking about belonging to God has the not our own and we are gods in that same sort of word. It might be just an interesting thing to look at if you want to kind of expand this. I, I will and send me which psalm it is. Yeah, I'll, I'll look for it. Um, okay, so here's another kind of take on it. So I'm proposing that the second statement answers the question mili. So a little bit algebraically, we can drop mili out of the equation and just say 
im ein ani li, ani le dodi vidodi li, which um, I will loosely translate as if I give myself to God, God gives himself to me. And uh, as a friend of mine said about a completely other subject, uh, I think that is news we can use. <laughs> so just focusing on that one, I, I think, you know, if I let go of the consciousness of me and mine, I can experience an identity which is beyond me and mine. It's, it's essentially divine. And um, we do find this in a lot of, I, I think it's, you know, it's, th I think this is an idea that's at home in Judaism, certainly in Hasidism. I mean, this is one small example, but I just happened to run into it um, when I was working on this. And, um, and it just so seems to so precisely address this uh, im ein anili language. Uh, Sfad Emet wrote a letter to his children and grandchildren. I'm just showing a little part of it here, but um, the, the frame of this particular idea in this letter was that th this, my, my children, th this, I'm going to tell you the secret of life. And, you know, Every person can be joined to God. You have to be negated. <laughs> that is to transcend the ego self in the spark of holiness. I mean, so that, I think, is what um, anila dodi vidodi li means. I think Emein Anili Mili is a riddle that calls our attention to this. And so just summing up that, you know, most riddles, riddles are fun. They give us the satisfaction of solving the puddle, puzzle. We get a nice aha moment. But this riddle is giving us not just a very nice puzzle, but but a pointer to the great secret of life. So, I'm, I'm, that's very interesting. And and I and I I think that first point that I got to is um, it's not um, it's not contradictory or at odds with this. This is just taking it a few steps farther. Yeah, someone wanted to. I, I was I was going to say that I'm I'm reminded now a little bit of uh, another Mishnah in Perkei which is kind of similar in some ways, uh, where it talks about the four types of people: shali shali v'shalcha shalcha, shalcha shali shali shalcha. What's yours is mine. What's yours is mine, and mine is yours. And it was, I think what's interesting kind of fits in with this idea is it talks about someone who says shali shali. The shalcha shalcha doesn't is meaning that's basically shali shali is sort of saying vani li is that's um midat stom and what's interesting about midat stom is that you know again stom is famous for not sharing right that's like part of the the idea there and we find that the descendants of lot um, who should have really learned from being from the negative events of being in stom they ended up similarly acting in, in, in that kind of way with Bnei Yisrael when they were in the bar. They didn't share the water and the, you know, water with them when they were coming through. They didn't learn from Avram, they learned from stone. And they basically had that midat stone. And the punishment for them is unusual in that it's not, you know, don't kill them or don't, you know, hate them. It's just, you can't marry them. Again, because if you have this, if you have midat stone where what's mine is mine, what's yours is yours, you can't possibly have that, you know, the relationship of a new, you could never get, if you have Midat Stone, if you have Shali Shali Vishra you could never get to Anil Diva Lili because your, you know, your, your walls are up. I don't know, your, 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 your inert elements, like I said before, however you want to describe it, you know, and, and you need to be able to, both sides need to be able to, uh, to um, compromise or to be able to admit that they're missing something in order for that breed, whether it's a breed of marriage or just a breed between man and God to, to occur. So that, that other mission sort of was echoing to me a little bit as well. 
That's beautiful. I love that. Mm-hmm. So let me go on. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rabbi. Go ahead. No, you're right. good. So uh, now my commentary on if not now when. Um, okay, so many things can be looked up from a trans. This is not exactly a sequitur, uh, but I think it's a good way to kind of. Um, it's a sequitur in a in a very you know, indirect way, put it that way. So I think there's both a transcendent perspective and an imminent perspective on this. And uh, the transcendent perspective, which I thought about, uh, which I don't think we usually think of, is that, you know, I I heard all my life, Judaism's a, a, a religion of this world, you know, and I think that... Um, that we can see in a nachshav, a matai, as a very sharp and very prescient rebuttal of the view that life on earth is just only preparation for something that comes after we die. And I say it's prescient because Hillel wrote this a long time before two and a half billion people on the planet were Christian and Muslim, where that idea that life on earth is only preparation for what comes later is is very strong but but then again it's not a new idea um, even the Egyptians uh, had this focus on the world to come so uh, I think that is a um, an interesting way to look at in a nachshav and matai and it does support it does sequitur in the sense that uh, he's talking about an opportunity um, to experience the divine in this life by you know surrendering to it by you know giving oneself to it and then the the other thing the imminent perspective you know um, I think that um, uh, particularly in discussions like this, it's always good to be reminded that it's not enough just to say the words, to analyze and understand them. That if the subject is something practical, uh, you have to practice it. And uh, we always need to be reminded of that, um, especially right here and right now. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. my presentation. I can't okay, believe I, I did it in pretty much in the time. We have a few minutes to discuss. Yeah, it's very fascinating. Um, I still am I'm finding the the riddle in Shira Shirim a little bit mind bending with your algebra and the substitution. Um, so I just want to make sure that I get it for a second. So let me see if I can. If I can repeat, I definitely see the connection. It does really feel, it's really, I, I have to compliment you. It's a, I think it's a brilliant stroke to connect Hill's words to those two words in Shira Shiram. It really feels like he is playing off of them. I just want to make sure I understand exactly your theory about how we're playing off of them. So you're saying, in Aina Neely Neely, you want to say, you want to take the Mealy and say mili, so dodili is the answer. So im ena mili mili, if I'm not going for me, who's going to be for you? Dodili, that's, that's dodili va'ani lo. Dodili va'ani lo is really the, the answer which has been suggested to. Right, or, 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 or the other one. I, I think either one works. I, I, used, I used them both here but but so yeah that's the algebra in other words so then it's anila do di the anilo okay ukshani la atsmi ma ani that part where and where is that part going to come from ukshani la atsmi ma ani is that also going back to me anili mili um and 
in your in your opinion that also going back to anid ludodi vadodi lo also going on ukshani latsmi if I am all alone right so well well chashez when not if that's part right. of my so so and when I am all alone when I'm so alone then, what am I what am I um. Are you connecting that as well? You weren't getting into that part. Is that right? I'm not connecting it as di- as directly and algebraically as I am here. Because, but all right, but let's just take your theory and just sort of run with it a little bit. Okay. So even if it's not algebraically connected, it still feels like let's let's accept your theory and your algebra with sentence one. Then Ukshani Laatsmi would sort of be Hillel's commentary sort of additional commentary on Shirashirim, it feels like. Almost as if what he's saying is, okay, so the riddle, the answer to the riddle of if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? Or if I am not mine, then then who am I? Or what can be mine? Or, or something like that. So the answer is, well, Anila Dodiva Dodili. So I'm not mine. I I've given myself over to my beloved. That's really the answer. I'm not I'm not making a claim on myself to be mine because I've sort of given myself over to be the other. And then maybe the commentary on that is Ukshani Laatsmi because if when I am alone, Ma'ani, there's a certain I feel broken. So, yeah, I'm I'm an unfulfilled or unwhole being. So when I give myself over to another, I give myself over to another so as to release myself from that feeling of loneliness, right? And in so doing, I'm no longer, I'm sort of relinquishing ultimate control over myself, right? Because to take it the other way, right? No, as if I... The, the way you suggest before in terms of, of mine, right? Now is to take all your theories and sort of put them together. If I am not mine, who could possibly be mine? See, I, I really think it's getting, Steve, to that if you put all this together, it really feels like part of the riddle is the, the two opposing poles. You know, we're, I think you really are going down that path also that you said you aren't going down. Right, because what it's really saying is, is that I'm sort of relinquishing possession of myself and opting for connection. That really feels like what's happening here. I, I've got to sit there, sit down, and sort of plot it out. But it feels to me like like the, the cautionary and explain the tension between the cautionary and explanatory explanations that you suggested yields the the conclusion of the riddle and Shirashiram as well. That if I am not for my notice, if I don't claim myself for myself and I release myself into a relationship with another, I'm doing so to not be alone. But in order to do that, I have to not claim myself as my own possession. I don't know. I've got to think it out more, but I think something's going on there. I'm, I'm, I can't put it exactly all together, but you've certainly given me a lot to think about. I suspect that everything you're saying fits. Uh, but um, since I'm not going to keep everybody here forever, I, I will say it's a, it's a fascinating doors that you've opened. And uh, very, very tantalizing. So thank you so much. It's really exciting. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, guys. Anything else as we round it out? No? Okay, Steve, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's a privilege to be able to tune in and and uh, hang out with all you guys and wonders of modern technology. We can do this from all over the places in the world and feel like we're all in the same room so that's kind of cool indeed so, yeah okay steve thank you so much i'm going to sign off here for the Tanya, and thank you and everybody else thank, thank you rabbi for staying up late and uh 
Ami, hello. I didn't have a chance to say hello to you. And thanks, everyone, for being here. And uh, thanks for this opportunity. Thank you. Really Thank you, Steve. It was really interesting. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay see you guys.